Good afternoon. Uh, it may very well be morning. I have no sense of time. <laughs> it's a singular honor to have been invited to address this conference as one of the keynote speakers. My gratitude extends in particular to the Australian Council for Educational Leaders and the Commonwealth Council for Educational Administration and Management, together with the partnering institutions, the Australian Professional Teachers Association, and the New South Wales Secondary Principals Council, and New South Wales Department of Education. In many African traditions, Cultural etiquette uh, demands that before a visitor settles in to enjoy the hospitality of his or her host, they register their arrival with the leadership of that community. It's usually the chief who is also the custodian of the land. And accordingly, I wish to pay due homage to the nation of the Iora of the Gadigal in whose ancestral country, I understand, we hold this conference. I bring good wishes from the people of South Africa and from the clan of Amagdina. I was last here in 2002, and I must admit that this particular visit has been psychologically challenging for me. We in South Africa just hosted the best World Cup ever. And so when I was packing my luggage, I was quite tempted to throw in uh, the memorabilia <laughs> that of course I would wear at the quickest excuse. And that is until my mind happened on the lack of wisdom perhaps behind this plan. Those of you who follow the sport of rugby will know that in 2002, which was the last year I was here, the Springboks had prevented Australia from making a hat-trick of the Tri-Nations in the final test series, which was won by the Springboks at Alice Park in Johannesburg by a score margin of 33-31. And this result, of course, gave me very good admiration and made that a very boastful visit for me. The dinner conversations were very, very wonderful. And as if to get even, someone had the memory so vengeful as to align this visit with the 2010 Tri-Nations, at which, of course, the tables were turned against South Africa. We suffered a 41-39 defeat to the Wallabies, and we took the third place this time around. So I'm here in a very unenviable position, addressing you with newfound respect and with humility. <laughs> I was invited to speak today in my capacity as the Chief Executive Officer of the Steve Biko Foundation. This nonprofit organization was founded in 1998 as a vehicle for community development inspired by the legacy of the father of black consciousness in South Africa, Bantu Steve Biko. Following a period of political disengagement, brought on by the massive arrest and incarcerations of leaders such as Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe, the father of Pan-Africanism in South Africa, who was arrested in 1961 and in the following year, Nelson Mandela. Uh, the genius of Biko and his black consciousness emerged in the mid-60s, creating and infusing a new consciousness and resistance based on a positive sense of self. It was a movement premised on the notion of self-reliance. And this movement professed that, and I quote, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Inspired by this legacy, the rationale behind the Steve Biko Foundation is to contribute to advancing South Africa, the continent, and the diaspora by focusing on the development of the intangible aspects of our democracies. 
often when we speak of development, it's in relation to the more physical aspects and assets of our nations. So in the case of South Africa, our development plans are unambiguous in relation to the miles of roads that need to be built, the number of power stations the economy requires, together with the water connections, the houses, schools, and hospitals that need to be constructed. And these are all very, very important for building a nation. However, oftentimes development planning terminates prematurely at this point and fails to appreciate the centrality of the intangible assets of a nation, the culture, identity, values, the issues that speak to the soul of a nation. Most nations are indeed a long way from articulating precisely the values that should fly their national flag. The Steve Biko Foundation uses the intervention of first dialogue and second leadership development to assist our partners with the capacity to participate in our democracies, contributing hopefully towards the birth of an enduring underbelly. One of the sectors we work in is, of course, the area of education, developing leadership in the education sector. And in this regard, we work developing curriculum, drawing on the legacies of marginalized individuals and communities to promote diversity. We advance school reform by encouraging community participation in school governing bodies, as well as through capacity building and leadership training for school administrators, educators, and learners. And finally, we promote a culture of dialogue, particularly focusing on the learners, through a debate program. For example, when we had the World Conference Against Racism, we took the themes from that UN conference and ran a competition and the winners then participated as a voice of youth at that conference in Durban. And the World Conference on Sustainable Development, we do the same, hopefully bringing into the radar screen of young South Africans issues that would otherwise uh, be lost to them. Now, having studied the conference package and the kind of speakers that we'll be presenting over the next two days, it's quite evident that the depth and experience across a wide range of aspects of education will bring to bear a truly rich and informative platform covering the three main themes, learning across boundaries, leadership and for, through, with, by, from learning, and of course, the art of hosting conversations that matter. It's my expectation that the lead papers and the workshops will enable the conference to examine a number of key questions, including what are the various approaches to educational reform and the appending lessons and experiences. And I think present here are practitioners and theoreticians from a vast number of settings. Are these reform practices in their settings? Do they hold, rather, the promise of delivering effective responsive educational models? And if so, how can we replicate these in less successful areas? The second question I hope will be answered by the conference is that which relates to the development of leadership in the education sphere. How do we build sustainable, self-replenishing layers of leadership across the full continuum of education from content development, legislation, to the delivery of education. What is the role of technology? And what platforms are available to enhance the teaching and learning experience? And how can we use technology to bridge the divide and provide more equitable access to educational opportunities? Going back to my days with uh, iAfrica.com and Metropolis Transactive, we looked to Australia for cutting edge models on the delivery of education over the internet, on instruction models. And since then, the advantages in technology 
have allowed for more speed and content, making remote quality real-time education not only a possibility, but a reality. Of course, there are many other questions. Uh, the development of the curriculum, education administration, teacher development support and appraisal methods, learning and support. Most of these questions, however, are about how we do things. And I want to propose a slightly different question, and I will return to it, the question I believe is critical. But first, I want to spend some time looking at what I call the politicization of education. And I'll use the example of South Africa, but I think the issues apply perhaps to many other settings in the Commonwealth. The first era of our education system, at least the formal education system, tends to be associated closely with the arrival of the white settler community in the Cape in, 19, in 1652, rather. One of the earlier conduits of education was the Christian missionary establishment, which spread into a network of colleges, starting initially in the Eastern Cape province and later reaching deeper into the country with the advancement of the settler community further northeast. Of these institutions, institutions like Lovedale College, Hilltown, St. Matthew's Adams College are credited with having contributed immensely to the development of a thick stratum of black intellectuals. In his book, African Intellectuals in the 19th and 20th century South Africa, Mkabisi Ndekiana introduces the lives and works of five exceptional African intellectuals based in the former Cape Colony during that period. Nsikana, Tiyosoga, John Tengo Jabavu, Mbilo Kubusana, and S.E.K. Mkai were pioneers within the African community contributing their thoughts and intellect to various fields including literature and poetry politics, religion, and journalism. The fundamental thesis and politics of the missionary education system in this colonial period was to reproduce a Eurocentric value system and political autonomy based on the paradigm of enlightenment of the native. It play, in places such as Australia, Ghana, Zimbabwe, the missionary educator pushed a similar agenda of loyalty to imperial power, and unquestioning buoyancy for white supremacy. In its worst form, this approach forced indigenous peoples to reject their values, and with them, the intricate lessons of their traditional value systems through the negative othering of those who clung to tradition. In the case of South Africa, dress, for instance, soon became a distinguishing feature. Amakaba, or those who, regarded, who were regarded as heathens, wore brown colored clothing, while the Christians or converts abandoned these in favor of, white, of a white clay dye, which was used to color their bodies, their garments, and later their houses. This distinction became a basis for a new discrimination paralleled only by that of race and pigmentation. In the case of Australia, it became the basis upon which children were stolen away from their families from as early as 1869 to rescue them from brownness or backwardness and to make them, I quote, more valuable citizens. Later, the likes of Mandela, Sobukwe, and Biko, following in the footsteps of these early intellectuals, began to question the idea that enlightenment could coexist with its purported liberal Christian underpinnings. In many ways, it seemed that backwardness was an inherent part of enlightenment. 
they presented a generation, the likes of Mandela, Biko, Sobukwe, a generation of products of missionary education that at once embraced and rejected the Western value system, at least as a default source of values and standards. With their voices having been made audible by the common language facilitated by the mission education, they rose to question the oppressive tendencies of the colonial value system. Some argued strongly that for a country in Africa, the default value system should in fact draw primarily from the rich African idiom or indigenous value system in defining the national identity. So Steve Biko argued, for example, that, and I quote, this is an African table and we must strip it of its colonial settings and dress it appropriately as African. And thereafter, whosoever wishes to join us at table is most welcome. The praxis of colonial education can therefore be summarized as that of mixed missionary blessings. First, providing access to good education for the colonized, but such access being underpinned by esteem for the colonial values and their presumed superiority, often at the cost of other values. The only difference noted by some scholars between these tendencies of various colonial uh, uh, patterns is that the Portuguese and the French, uh, for them the modus operandi of colonization was that of cultural assimilation. And for the British, the English, the colonial foot footprint experience is that of uh, segregation. The second era I just want to touch on quickly is that which I define as the apartheid era. And it starts in 1948 with the emergence into power of the Nationalist Party and ends in 1994. If before 1948 education was merely supportive of the political agenda, then in 1953 it became the mainstay of the political agenda with the passing of the Bantu Education Act of 1953. And this act enforced a separation of races in all education institutions. Even universities were made tribal. And all but three missionary schools shut down when the government withdrew their subsidy. Only the Roman Catholic, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Congregationalists, and the United Jewish Reform Congre Congregation continued their own, with their own finances to support education for Native Africans. In 1959, the National Party passed a further law, the Extension of Universities Act, which barred blacks from entrance to white universities. Separate university colleges were set up on an ethnic linguistic basis, and the prestigious University College of Voltaire, which has produced people like Nelson Mandela, was taken over by the government and degraded to being part of the Bantu education system. And the policy of Bantu education was, as the Minister Fervut at the time said, there is no place for Bantu in the European community above the, certain, uh, the level of certain forms of labor. What is the use of teaching the Bantu child mathematics when it cannot use it in practice? That is quite absurd. Education must train people in accordance with their opportunities in life according to the sphere in which they live." Unquote. The government controlled the curriculum uh, in segregated schools and the books were written in a very negative derogatory narrative. One of the stories I like talking about which had many an uh, innocent black child giggling in naive uh, admiration is that of one Dick King, a British soldier, a soldier who together with his servant Undongeni took on a grueling ride in 1852 from the town of Grahamstown of Durban to the town of Grahamstown. And the purpose was to warn the British regiment there that Durban was under uh, imminent attack. The journey was that of a thousand kilometers. 
The story ends with not a single reference to why two settler communities were pummeling each other down at the belly of Africa, nor with accolades to Ndongeni for skillfully negotiating a passage through the various Amakosa, Amambondo, and Amazulu settlements of highly apprehensive and combatant communities, at least at the time. It ends instead with a deliberate ridicule of Ndongeni, who goes down in history for none of the accolades accorded to Dick King, but his severe chafing from horse riding. The introduction of Bantu education further led to a huge reduction of government aid to the already ailing learning institutions of black Africans. <clears throat> 